Chapter 12 is entitled Leading to Victory. Leaders influence people to work to achieve the organization's objectives. We frequently use manager and leader interchangeably, but we shouldn't because they're not necessarily the same. The next two slides get at the differences between a manager and a leader, one via a video and the other one through a lovely cartoon. Leadership and management are really totally different things. Uh, leadership is what is hard or what is impossible or what can't be done and why we're going to go do it. Hey, here's my vision. Here's where we're going. Here's the city on the hill. Here's the mountain that we're uh, trying to climb. That's leadership. Management is, okay, hey, let's get, the, uh, let's get all the cars together. Do we have enough food? Hey, everybody take your bathroom break You know, uh, when we stop in a half hour, okay? All right, now it's going to take us 17 hours to get to the top of the mountain. Let's go. That's the difference between leadership and, uh, and management. So in terms of uh, leadership style, I've always focused on, hey, what's the, what's the vision? My company, thelanders.com, we're trying to do something really, really different uh, than the other 45,000 uh, job-related companies that have been started. So we're doing something really different. We're doing it for a reason. And why is that important to people? What is it that we're uh, trying to do? Why, why should you be here? So that's my leadership style. Management style is uh, really... Uh, more focused around what are hey, what is it that we actually have to accomplish? Great, you're going to go uh, do that. Fantastic. Uh, you're going to get back to me by when? Okay, that's the deadline. What's the uh, what's the thing that you're going to do for me? You know, so dates and deadlines and uh, and details are an important part of management as opposed to leadership. And they're both important, but in entrepreneurial settings, leadership is particularly important. This cartoon also illustrates the difference between a manager and a leader. Usually a manager is one who has to put out fires, deal with the immediate um, details, whereas a leader creates a vision, sets a culture of an organization, has more of a long-range, big-picture idea about things. So in terms of leadership style, it's the combination of st traits, skills, and behaviors managers use to interact with employees. The next slide actually has a video of the first ESPN broadcast in 1979. So if you think about where ESPN was in 1979 as a fledgling news station to where it is now, a multi-billion dollar corporation, this is in part due to leadership and vision that arguably has revolutionized sport media. The leadership of Christine Dreesen and John Skipper have been at the forefront of reinventing sport media, creating numerous outlets like ESPNW, ESPNU, ESPN Deportes that have reached out to specific target markets fans of women's sport, fans of collegiate sport, as well as Spanish-speaking customers. Yea, verily, a sampler of wonders. Hi, I'm Lee Leonard, welcoming you to Bristol, Connecticut, 110 miles from New York City. Why Bristol? Because here in Bristol is where all the sports action is as of right now. And we're just minutes away from the first event on the ESPN schedule. That's the 1979 NCAA College Football Preview. And then we're going to follow that with a doubleheader of games. Two of the professional Slow Pitch League World Series games will be seen tonight. Now, softball is one of those rare sports that everybody knows something about. Why? Because we all play it on Sunday when we drink a little beer. Now, here's another in innovation on ESPN. And it's going to be a big part of our future. The Sports Center with George Grant. He'll have the latest on what's happening all around. George? Thanks, Lee, and welcome everyone to the ESPN Sports Center. From this very desk, in the coming weeks and months, we'll be filling you in on the pulse of sporting activity, not only around the country, but around the world as well. If it takes an interview, we'll do it. If it takes play-by-play, -play, we'll do it. If it takes commentary, we'll do that too. That's the way we'll function from the ESPN Sports Center. We'll be filling you in on further updates as the broadcast progresses. The key thing to take away from this is that they've been studying traits of beha and behaviors of effective leaders for 70 years. 300 studies have been conducted. and There's no universal list of traits that all leaders possess. In addition to studying traits, people have spent a lot of time studying leadership behavior in a number of different ways. The two-dimensional leadership model focuses on leadership behavior and came out of Ohio State University and the University of Michigan. And it focuses on two things, what they call initiating structure, that it's basically job-centered, or consideration, employee-centered. 
So initiating structure means that the extent to which managers take charge to plan, organize, lead, and control as the employee performs tasks. So they, are they setting them up for success? And it focuses on getting the job or task done. Consideration is the extent to which managers develop rapport, trust, and a strong personal connection with the employee. So as you can see, the way the grid set up, there are numerous possibilities in which the manager could be really low on employee consideration, but really high on structure. So they don't have a good relationship with the employee, but they're really focused on getting the job done. Or vice versa, where it's really high with employee um, consideration and low structure, et cetera. The leadership grid is based on the same leadership dimensions as the two-dimensional model. In the grid, these dimensions are called concern for production and concern for people. The leadership grid identifies the ideal leadership style as having a high concern for both production and people. So if we look at these different areas of the grid here, and you take this one right here. So one one impoverished leader has a low concern for both production and people, so they don't care about getting the job done nor do they want to establish relationships with their employees. For 9-1, right here, the authority compliance leader has a high concern for production and a low concern for people. So they really want to get the job done, but again, they're not um, emphasizing establishing that connection with their employees. And the 1-9, our country club leader, has a high concern for people and a low concern for production. So what that means is they really essentially the opposite of the other one, in that they don't care about getting the job done as much, but they really want to establish a connection with their employees. The 5-5, five five, aka middle of the road leader, has a balanced concern for both production and people. And then finally, 9-9, nine nine, the team leader has a high concern for both production and people. So this is where the people who created this grid want people to be in that 9-9 nine nine range. The contemporary perspectives focus on four areas, charismatic, transformational, transactional, and symbolic leadership. Charismatic leaders inspire loyalty, enthusiasm, and high levels of performance. They have a goal or a vision and a strong personal commitment to achieving that goal. They can also communicate the goal to others and get them on board with helping them achieve it. Followers often trust and adopt the beliefs of charismatic leaders. They feel affection for them and they obey them. Transformational leaders emphasize change and innovation to take their organization to the next level. There are three main acts within this process. One is they identify a need for revitalization. So when Bill Belichick took over the Patriots in the early 2000s, they were just coming off a couple of down years with Pete Carroll. So he wanted to, or Robert Kraft saw Belichick as the person who would take them back to the Super Bowl like Bill Parcells had. And for those of you that don't know, the Patriots were never very good. So when Parcells took over, there was some success, and then it went back down with Carroll, and then Belichick came and created this new vision, a long-term plan about what they wanted to achieve, and institutionalized those changes through hiring staff, policies and procedures, um, and the ways in which they run their off-season programs and their expectations for athletes. So unlike the other two styles of leadership, transactional focuses on exchange, so you're either giving a consequence or a reward for your employees to get them to follow you and invest in you as a leader. Symbolic leaders establish and maintain a strong organizational culture. Employees learn that organizational culture, shared values, beliefs, assumptions of how they should behave through the symbolic leader. This starts with upper level management and flows down through first, down, first line managers. Situational leadership models consider contextual factors and suggest that leaders adapt their style to fit the situation and employees. Or, as Fiedler would suggest, change the actual situation and not your leadership style. Fiedler believed that our leadership style reflects our personality, so he's more trait theory and remains basically constant, meaning that they don't change their style. But also that contingency leaders are either task or relationship oriented and that your style should fit the situation. So first you have to figure out whether your task and relationship oriented are you more focused on getting the job done or are you more focused on or comfortable with creating lasting relationships and rapport with employees. 
then you look at whether or not the situation is favorable. So it's the degree to which a situation enables the leader to exert influence over the followers. In order to do that, you have to ask yourself a few questions. Is the relationship good or poor? Is the task structured or unstructured? So do employees perform repetitive and routine tasks? And then does the leader have a lot of power or a little power? Depending on the answers to those questions will help you figure out what type of leadership style you need to use. House's path goal model focuses on how leaders influence employees' perceptions of their goals and their paths to follow to attain those goals. So there are a few different factors that play into this. One is subordinate situational characteristics. So how well do the employees deal with authoritarianism? Do they defer? Do they want to be independent? Their locus of control, so the extent to which employees believe they can control their own goals or whether they believe achieving their goals is controlled by somebody else, as well as their ability. So are they good at their job? Are they highly skilled? And some environmental factors like the task structure itself, the leader's power in the work group. So if you use, keep these factors in mind, there are several different leadership styles that are articulated here on the slide that you need to use in certain situations with some of these contextual factors. Tannenbaum and Schmidt stated that leadership behavior is on a continuum from boss-centered on the one side to employee-centered leadership on the other. So before selecting one of the seven leadership styles, the leader must consider the following factors or variables. So one, what is the manager's preferred leadership style? Two, what's the subordinate's preferred style for the leader? So do they want their leader to be autocratic and to just tell them what to do the whole time? Do they want them to be participative, et cetera? And then finally, the situation. So if it's a repetitive routine task, how much, lead, like how much of a leader do they need if it's something they do continually? In terms of contingency management, the manager needs to analyze the employee's capability level and then select a leadership type for the situation at hand. In terms of the autocratic style you use when working with employees who have little ability and need precise details, and so employees provide very little input into the process. In terms of a consulting style, it's when employees have a decent level, moderate level of ability, still highly directive, but also you play a little bit more of a supportive role. In terms of a participative style or participative role, this transitions into a less directive style, but still high supportive employees. In this case, you trust that your employees have the ability to get the job done well, so you don't need to micromanage. And then finally, the empowerment style is at the end of the continuum where you provide little support and direction, otherwise known as laissez-faire leadership. This typically works when you have excellent experience and self-motivated employees. The chapter also discusses several areas in which leadership may not be needed or could be substituted. First is focused on subordinate characteristics. So if you have really good, talented, experienced, well-trained, independent employees, you may not lead, you may not need to engage in leadership behavior because they already are focused and ready to go and achieve those organizational goals. So leadership may not be necessary if tasks are routine, clear, and in coordination with the previous slide in which you have re like really good, well-trained, experienced employees who can figure it out. The final component of leadership substitutes are organizational characteristics. So taking the two things in the previous slide with really good employees, routine and repetitive tasks, and then you also have a highly form formalized um, structure in which job descriptions and job characteristics are spelled out pretty clearly. There are some real specific job functions. Leadership is not necessarily a primary um, need at this point. So as discussed earlier in the lecture, leaders and organizations often set the overall vision for that particular organization. The managers can also be leaders, but they primarily deal with day-to-day -day issues. There are a number of different leadership styles to choose from that may work. It is up to the manager to be able to decode the situation to determine which leadership style would best suit themselves, the employee, and the situation. And if you look at this um, graph or chart here of ESPN's estimated subscriber revenue, I don't think they could have imagined in 1979 that in 2016, 2015, they would be making $7.28 billion. 
And that speaks to the leadership of Christine Dreesen and John Skipper, who have diversified their offerings, created multiple channels and different outlets in which to grow the revenue and grow the consumer fan base who uses and pays for ESPN. So it's basically a sign of excellent leadership within that organization.